of the disclaimer will be the comprehension of the neurological examination slides that I have put is probably uh, you know, uh, a mixture of multiple uh, inputs. You know, I have probably some things you will see from old pay, some from milling words, from, from some standard books, some from uh, some standard neurological examination. So uh, the standard disclaimer will be that there might be little variations in what you would have probably learned at your uh, center and how I'm going to teach. But uh, uh, trust me, the overall, the essence of neurological examination will remain the same, whether, or whether I might be putting it here and there. I have tried my level best to simplify it and uh, specifically keeping in mind that you're all exam going uh, fellows. So uh, precisely hitting the nerves of saying what exactly is expected out of that 20 minutes that is given to you to do a detailed neurological examination, which itself is a big challenge. You know, it's not easy to complete a neonatal neurological examination within that uh, 10, 15, 20 minutes or 30 minutes time that you get. So I think with that disclaimer saying that I have tried to simplify the topic for you, I've tried to put the most important aspects of it. I've left a few deliberately, maybe if you bring it up during the discussion, I'll answer to all your queries. So I think with that, uh, uh, with uh, permission from Dr. Rajesh and uh, Suman, I'll, I'll start my presentation. Yeah. And uh, is it full uh, screen? Yeah, it, it's it's we can yeah that's fine. Now it is in slideshow mode, so it's fine. Yeah. Okay. Now the uh, maybe I'll just minimize this one. Yes. So the most important thing is neurological examination is the cornerstone for assessment of neonates' neurological function. So there is there is no doubt that if I have to assess a neurological function of a newborn, you need a systematic neurological examination which may give me some information about how's the baby. Is the baby neurologically normal? Is the baby neurologically abnormal? Does he have any issue? I need to have a very systematic and structured neurological examination. Examination of neonate requires a very careful eye and minimal intuition. This is exactly in contrary to how you would do a neurological examination in an older patient or an older child for that matter, where you do a lot of intervention. You, you do a lot of things on the child to elicit the information. But as far as a newborn is concerned, I think the best thing that you could do, the most important aspect of doing a neurological examination is to just stand there and watch the baby. Like Olpe says in his introduction, you know, when people ask him to perform neurological examination, he would go wash his hands and, you know, just stand there next to the baby and people would wonder why are you not doing anything? He says, the most important aspect of neurological examination is to just observe the baby. And I think you get to know a lot about the baby just by standing there and watching without unnecessarily touching and doing and, you know, making the baby fretful. A systematic approach is very, very important, like how I have tried to put things then. You may not necessarily do that in the exams. You may not necessarily do all the steps in that order, but I think the information that you gather is in a very systematic manner. But when you're presenting, at least, I think you need to present in that systematic manner. Serial examination is important for meaningful interpretation. Now, this is very important that if I do a neurological examination at one point of time, it does not give me all the information. For simple instance, like two days back, we had a baby in the unit which had referred with perinatal asphyxia. I mean, last week, the baby initially was told to be very irritable, not showing any features of HIE at the time of admission, which was just about two or three hours of life. Now, does it mean I have all the information on this baby? No, it needs a re-evaluation. So when we re-evaluated this baby at six hours, he started showing some signs of encephalopathy. At 12 hours, he threw a conversion. He went into frank encephalopathy. So what it means is doing a one-point assessment does not give you all the information. You need to have serial examination to get a much more meaningful interpretation. It also holds good when you're discharged a high-risk neonate. At the time of discharge, the baby might look relatively normal. Does not mean the baby is fine. I need to reevaluate this baby at 40 weeks of corrected. Let's say I have a preterm baby, a high risk neonate, two to up discharge. I need to reassess him at 40 weeks. I need to reassess him at three months of corrected, six months, and so on. Why do we need it? The symptoms might evolve, the signs might evolve. You might have transient tone abnormality, which might get better. The child was looking normal, might start showing tone abnormality. What is 
the point that we need to all remember is one point assessment is not enough for us whether it's in the immediate newborn period or on the follow-up, a serial examination is very, very important for us to get a meaningful interpretation. All right. Now, what do we need for neurological examination? A simple bell that can make little noise, not a very loud bell, uh, so that you know uh, it should not be crossing 90 decibels, you know, preferably around 40, 50. A very simple bell that you use in your puja room is enough for to make to test your auditory. A torch, an ophthalmoscope. A reflex hammer, preferably a, a neonatal size. Don't 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 carry those uh, big adult type of hammers. A very small, the rounded are the better ones because they hurt less. A cotton tip capillator, not very common because we don't expect you to do the first cranial nerve examination. If you are very keen or at least want to demonstrate, then that is needed. A measuring tape to document a head circumference, and I think something which I have put in lot is lot of patience. Why I'm saying this is, you cannot just go and you say, oh, I have 20 minutes now, I'm going to get this baby, baby sleeping, I'll wake him up and I do start doing all examinations, just not possible. You need to have a lot of patience, patience and patience if you want a very meaningful information out of that particular baby. I think that's very, very point and that's why I probably put that this is most important item that you need to carry with you when you're doing neurological examination. I know in the exam, sometimes you might be under a lot of stress, still does not mean that you start disturbing the baby and you will not be able to get whatever little information that you wanted. You can always politely say that I could not do a particular thing as the child was sleeping or this. I would like to re-examine once the child is awake. I think most of the examiners would appreciate that statement from you rather than to say that, oh, hook or crook, I wanted to get all the information out of this baby. Much before even you start neurological examination, you cannot just start neurological examination without completing these prerequisites. What is the prerequisites? I need to have a good perinatal history. I cannot do a neurological examination of the baby without having an adequate perinatal history, which includes a previous unexplained sibling death, previous babies having any neurological abnormalities, present pregnancy, the antenatal complication, does they have gestation diabetes, did she have an abruption, did she have any malpresentation, adequate history in and around time of the delivery, was there a cord collapse, was there a meconium, was there an asphyxia, what were the APGAS scores, what were the details of resuscitation, did we have a cord ABG? I think we need to have a very good history much before you examine the baby. Now, I have a very typical scenario, why I say history is so important is, let's say, uh, like yesterday, I mean, today early morning, we had a baby, I mean, yesterday, when the previous baby had on at the end of day five, day seven, had developed some query respiratory distress, went to have some lethargy, and within 48 hours, baby had died. And this baby also came with a similar history of saying, baby had a doubtful hypoglycemia, went in to have seizures, went into encephalopathy, and we knew we were probably dealing with invulnerable metabolism. A baby who has been referred to you with history of difficult delivery, he has a massive cephalhematoma, there is a doubtful fracture, this baby has come with focal seizures, you know what you're dealing with. Probably you're dealing with intracranial. There is a bit of difficult extraction, baby had required resuscitation, baby has now come with lethargy, you know what we are dealing with. So I think without that specific history, you cannot jump onto the examination and try to make sense out of it. At the end of your examination, you should have been able to make the sense of history, the examination, interpretation, and tell the examiner with this history and with this findings, I think my probable diagnosis would be this. Gestational assessment is very important because the whole aspect of tone, a 28 weeker by its virtue of being premature is hypotonic. A 40 weeker would have achieved its normal tone. And again, subsequently, when you examine this baby, you need to have a corrected gestation is because a 28 weeker at three months is just 40 weeks of corrected gestation. It will still be showing a flexor tone as compared to a normal 40 weeks baby whom you are assessing at three months who might show on popliteal angle of 90 to 110. So it's very important that we know the gestational assessment much before you initiate the examination. And you need to keep this in mind when you are doing a follow-up of a baby or you have been in the exams, been given a three-month-old baby, you need to understand that you need to apply your tone for that corrected age and not for the chronological age. 
I need to be very clear about the drug history. Did the baby get any, receive any drugs? Is the baby on multiple anticonvulsant? Is that the reason why the baby is start to showing little lethargy or is not being so active? Feeding history is important that this baby, have, when was the last feed given? Because if you're just examining the baby immediately after feed, the baby might be very difficult to wake up. You might be fast asleep and you may not be able to carry on with your meaningful neurological examination. So ideal time roughly is an about hour after the last feed when he's just okay to wake up and don't wait for the next feed because then he's very agitated and very angry and he may not be able to get you again, not be able to elicit all the meaningful information. So these are some of the prerequisites. Even before you start your neurological examination, you need to have these informations right in your hand. And with this background, you need to approach the baby. And even before you do a, your systemic neurological examination, there are a few things that you need to do. You might do it as a part of your head to toe in the exams, or specifically, I've been you have been told only to do neurological examination. I think these are the or these are the some of the important aspects that you may have to do. Or even if you are doing it as a part of your head to toe examination, these are the points that we expect you to highlight in the general physical examination, keeping in mind that you are proceeding this child or proceeding with neurological examination in this particular baby. The most important aspect of neurological examination to have a complete information on the head of the baby. What I mean by head of the baby is you need to look at the shape and size. Does the baby's head look normal? Does he have any ox? You know, uh, the dolichocephalic head, does he have any flat oxyphor? Does he have any abnormal shape of there? Does it look oxycephalic? I might be interested in knowing is the size looking normal? Does he have a baby have a microcephaly or a macrocephaly? Because that gives you a lot of information onto the baby's, you know, the neurological condition as well. So I need to be very clear that the shape and the size of the head is normal. The fontanelles, does the anterior fontanel looks okay? Does it look very wide? Does it look bulging? Does it look closed prematurely? The posterior fontanelle or meeting a tip is, might be normal, but a wide posterior fontanelle might tell you whether there is some rise intracranial pressure. Let's say this was a preterm baby who was on ventilator, who had had a, a sepsis and he has gone through a terrific neonatal course. Now we are seeing at 40 weeks, you are seeing a very wide anterior fontanelle, very wide posterior fontanelle, you might be worried whether this baby is having post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus. The subsequent neurological findings might correlate with rise intracranial pressure. You might be able to make a much more meaningful interpretation of those neurological findings. If you start seeing a very prematurely closed with overriding, the next important thing is you are seeing sutures. Basically, you are trying to see overriding of the sutures. At 40 weeks, does he have overriding? With prematurely closed fontanelle, that means this baby is probably heading towards poor head growth, probably is a candidate for developing early or already started showing early signs of cerebral palsy. A poor head growth with overriding of sutures is one of the very early markers to say this baby is probably going to end up with a lot of tone abnormalities or cerebral palsy. Ridging, not very common though, that probably will tell you. The difference between overriding and ridging is, overriding is overlapping of the sutures. Ridging is when you feel the sutures, you feel as if they've been stitched together. That ridging will tell you more about craniosynostosis, whereas overriding tells you probably poor head growth and probably secondary microcephaly. A very wide suture suppression again tells you probably whether he's having a post hemorrhagic or a post meningitic hydrocephalus that along with a wide anterior fontanelle or tense or full anterior fontanelle will tell you probably this baby is having a rise in tachyonic pressure. You need to have a very clear documented occipital post frontal circumference or a head circumference being documented at the time of discharge at the time of your first neurological examination. And this is something without fail, you will do every time the child comes for follow-up. You did it at discharge, you document at 40 weeks, you document at one month, document at three months, six months. You need to keep a very close watch on the head growth because as I told you, a poor head growth is a very ominous sign and it tells you this probably baby is gonna end up with a lot of problems. So I think examination of head is very, very crucial as a part of your head to toe examination or individual. I think you need to have this all this information even before you begin your systemic neurological examination. 
The next is definitely as a part of your neurological examination, you need to comment on the spine. Basically, you're again trying to look for any neural tube defects which might have been missed, but you are going to see it. And if it is there, you know the subsequent neurological findings. What if it has a, a definite neural tube defects and the lower limb is showing hypotonia, you know what you're dealing with. Examination of face and eye, again, as a part of your head to toe or as a part of your neurological examination, you are expected to look for any features of facial dysmorphism is there and you cannot get away without doing a simple eye examination to look for a corneal opacities or cataracts. That gives you a clue towards whether this baby is having an inborn error metabolism. Are you dealing with some genetic disorders or are you dealing with some intrauterine infection? So I think examination of eye, even when you're saying head to toe, you need to specifically say there are not no corneal opacities. There are no evidence of cataract. And the next question examiner would ask you is, okay, this baby's neurological exam is abnormal and this child is having cataract. Tell me what are your few differential diagnoses? So that is how you lead the examiners to ask you questions based on your findings. Once you have done with that, once you have taken adequate history, once you have done your basic examination of the head, eyes, face, and spine, now you proceed towards what I would call it as a systemic neurological examination. There are four main domains that we are going to do neurological examination. One is the higher motor functions, cranial nerve examinations, motor system and sensory system. And the last is the primitive reflex. So I'll be going under each domain. I think this is broadly, if there is, there is little bit variations here and they don't get worried. I think uh, at the end of this, I will uh, probably ask other experts whether they would agree with this particular format. If there's any change, I think Dr. Suman or anybody can contribute. But I think broadly, I think this has been sort of a standard uh, domains that we test the neurological examination. What exactly do you mean by higher motor functions? We are looking at two specific findings in the higher motor functions or two specific areas that we are going to assess. One is the level of alertness. The second is the quality of crime. Consolability and habituation, though in some areas they have put it as behavioral response, some people would consider it as a part of higher mental functions. At PGA, we would always put this as a part of our higher mental functions. To me, it does does reflect a higher cortical functions or a part of higher mental functions. But if some of our books don't mention this and they mention it separately, don't get worried. That's why some of the things which are sort of questionable, I have just put it in italics and say, these are okay to mention it. Or if you examine it, it's, no, 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 I don't want it here. It's completely okay. But I think level of alertness and cry are two important aspects. You're going to definitely test in higher motor functions. What do I mean by level of alertness? There are two aspects of level of alertness that you all should be very, very clear about. One is what is the level of alertness at the time when you approach the baby? And the second most important is the baby should have state to state variability. What I mean is the level of alertness keeps changing throughout the examination. So more than that state at which you begin with, what is important is did the baby show you a state to state variability, did it vary between different state of sleep is very, very important. What I have put here is Brazelton's classification. There are pressures and there are old pace uh, level of sensorium or state of consciousness. You can adopt any one in the exams, they're all fine. This has five state pressures, adds one more as deep sleep, light sleep. Then he puts it as quite alert, active alert, and crying, drowsiness, and same. Uh, the old pay describes it as a uh, mild stupor, moderate to severe stupor. Then he, he calls it as the baby being in a drowsy state. Then there is, uh, then I think he calls it as baby being irritable or baby being lethargic. So there is a slight variations in how old pay describes the level of sensorium. Brazelton or pressures are an accepted thing. In Brazelton, it is light sleep. And as meant by light sleep is that the child is sleeping, but is having little bit of activity with some eye movements being seen. Drowsiness is just a transition state between awake on sleep or sleep and awake. That means you're sleeping, you just wake up, is in the typical state of drowsiness. Quite alert is when the child is calm, is quite open, his eyes is bright looking, it's not making much of the movements. 
active uh, wakefulness, like Pressure's got, calls is that quiet wakefulness or active wakefulness. In active alert state as per Brazilton's, it is the baby is awake, he's active, he's showing, trying to show some periods of fussiness. Crying, yes, the baby is loud and strong and crying. So what I would expect throughout the examination is the baby will vary from one state to other state. What exactly I mean, when I went near the baby, baby was probably in light sleep. I started touching the baby, he just woke up, he looked around, he was in sort of a quiet alert. Then I started to proceed with examination, he became very alert, he didn't like my touch, he started to become very fussy. And then I continued my examination, he got very irritated, he started crying. Then I tell the mother, no, 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 you're okay, you console the baby for a while, give him a pacifier or ask the mother to cuddle the baby. The baby again comes down to active alert or quiet alert. So what it means is throughout the examination, there will be variation in the state to state. And that is a very important sign to say this baby is neurologically normal. I will just show you the videos of two babies whom this baby is typically in what I would call it as in a quiet, alert phase where he's just open his eyes, he's looking a little bright, not making any major movements. This is a very ideal state to do neurological examination, though he may not remain in this state throughout, but your initial period, if you can have the baby in this state, what we call it as a quiet alert or quiet wakefulness. I think that's in the exams, if they ask you, which is the best stage to do neurological examination, your answer should be quiet wakefulness or quiet alert phase. I'm running another video where this baby is sort of what we call it as is in a quiet sleep where he's just making, but you can see there is a little movement here and there when it does, but otherwise most of time is in a quiet sleep. This is not a very good state to do neurological examination. So this was a sort of a quiet sleep and this was when the child was quite alert or a light sleep. So two things that you need to understand is the level of alertness can be based on Brazilton's, pressures or old pace, doesn't matter in the exams, but most important is there has to be state to state. You need to tell that to the examiner. When I approached the baby, baby was in this level of alertness as per pressures or resultants. But throughout examination, the maximum stage that he reached was stage five or he was crying and the minimum stage he was was in a quiet alert state. I think those statements are very, very important in exams. The next important is assessment of the cry. A normal cry is very loud and dusty. You know, you would have seen a child who's normal, he would have a very loud, lusty cry. If you see a child who's sick or who's neurologically depressed, he might just make very weak cry sounds and it's not as loud and lusty. You can barely hear him crying. That's a, a cry of a neurologically abnormal or a depressed child. Sometimes when you're in the NICU, suddenly you hear that one irritable cry or one irritating cry, which is very shrill, high-pitched cry, that always suggests there is some CNS irritability. Typically, if you have noticed a child who is having HI stage one, he will have that very shrill, high-pitched cry, which sometimes are difficult to console. Those are the cry which, you know, tells you that probably this is due to CNS irritability and that something is wrong with this baby. A baby is having rise in the clay pressure. He can have a typically high-pitched cry. The bilirubin, acute bilirubin encephalopathy, baby might have that typical high-pitched cry. So I usually tell my postgraduate this clue. A normal cry is very pleasant to your ears. You don't get irritated with a baby normally crying, at least most of us neonatologists are a pediatrician. If any cry is sort of annoying you, that cry is probably a high-pitched cry and that always tells you something is wrong with this baby. Consolability and habituation. What is consolability? When the child was crying, how easy it was for you to console this baby? I could have just given him a pacifier. I just held him tight. I just flexed his arms. I just restrained him. Did it calm him down? A normal baby, moment you console him, mother, or you ask the mother to just hold and cuddle the baby, the baby gets consoled. This is what we expect with a normal baby. But I do not know how many of you have seen an HI baby on follow-up who's heading towards evolving CP. The typical complaint that you get from the mother is this baby, he's highly Difficult to console whether he has feed, he doesn't have feed, whether he sleeps, he doesn't sleep, he's irritable all the time. I'm fed up with this baby because he just doesn't get consoled easily. 
you know this baby is probably heading towards problem that you are heading towards an evolving CP. A baby who's very fretful, who doesn't have a good sleep-wake cycle, who's not very easy to console, is probably a baby who's neurologically abnormal or definitely he's heading towards a lot of problem. What do you mean by habituation? This is a cortically inhibitory function. That means after you give repeated stimuli, the child will stop responding to it. He says, no, I'm not going to respond to you. A typical example is you try to repeatedly shine the torch and he does the blink reflex. After about four or five blink reflex, next time you do the torch, shine the torch on his eyes, he will stop responding to you. That is habituation, which is normal. You start doing some auditory response. You give auditory stimulate. He responded once or twice, thrice, and after that, he stops. So usually after about four or five stimulations, even repeated glabular tap, any of this, what it means is after about four or five times you stimulate the baby, after that, he cortex says, no, I'm not going to respond to this anymore. This is a normal. Having habituation is normal. If the child continues to respond to your stimuli, it means there is something wrong with the cortical functions. So both this consolability and habituation has got to do with the higher cortical function. That's why I always feel this could be a part of your higher motor or higher mental functions. Now I'm coming to cranial love examination. Uh, if, if somebody wants me to stop at that point and clarify, I would be happy to clarify. Or you want me to finish my exam, uh, the presentation and then clarify, I'm okay with both. Uh, Suman, uh, do you want people to stop me in between and ask or you want them to finish my exam uh, presentation and then ask the questions? I think Dr. Suman must be busy. So feel free to uh, uh, talk or interrupt me. Uh, Sarita ji, how do you want me to do? Yeah, how are you? I would like. So if you I, want I to, yeah, I... the participants to uh, you know uh, raise their hands, and you can just see if anybody wants any clarification. There are there itself, or I finish the examination. I mean the whole process, and then you can come back to. Okay, so now I'm going to the cranial nerve examination. Here, I think most of aspects of cranial nerve examination is done by observation, observation, and observation. Very less intervention is needed when you are doing cranial nerve examination. Okay. First cranial nerve. Do we routinely test in the exams? No. We do not expect you to test cranial nerve examination. But should we know how to do it? Yes, you should know how to do it. If I'm the examiner, I ask you, okay, we've not done it, but tell me if I ask you to do, how would you do it? Simple things, you take a cotton wig or a cotton, uh, you know, uh, earbuds or anything, uh, peppermint I start or any strong smelling thing, you no, know, in anything which is strong smelling, a uh, nilgiri oil or a wig, so anything that can have a strong smell, you bring it close to the baby. A baby who's more than 32 weeks will respond with respond with suddenly start making some sucking movements. He starts getting a rose. Or sometimes he might just withdraw. He doesn't like that smell. He might just withdraw. He can do both or he can do one of them. If he's, if he's just very happy, he might just do little arousal and sucking. But if he gets too irritated, he might just show withdrawal. And when it comes to olfactory discrimination, people have gone to the extent of demonstrating that baby can smell his own maternal breast milk. People have tried to look at the breast pads and try to bring it to the baby. And suddenly they found the baby started to become little arose. Sometimes it turns towards that. He starts making sucking movements. People have tried to look at whether he does it between his own mother's milk and some other. The, the preference was for his own maternal breast milk. People have felt neonates do respond even to the amniotic fluid, which they have been smelling in the utero for a very long time. So people have gone to the extent of seeing olfactory discrimination, but all you need to know is a baby who's more than 32 weeks can smell. He might show you some response when you bring him a breast milk, when you bring him some strong smelling things. And that tells you the cranial nerves is normal. You may not be able to differentiate right, left, and all, but you should be able to tell you whether the cranial nerve is normal or not. Second cranial nerve, optic nerve. What are the things we need to do? Simple things. What do we do? We shine the light at the eyes. Less than 28 weeks do not have that strong. They might not show you much of a response, but a baby who's more than 28 to 32 weeks, <clears throat> more than 32 weeks preferably, will show you a very consistent what we call blink response. Every time you shine the light, the baby will close the eyes. 
Keep the light on, he will close. Switch off the light, he'll open the eyes. Blink response to the light is normal seeing after 28 to 32 minutes. What is the second thing that you can do to test the vision? Bring a bright object. In the exams, we expect you to carry a red woolen fluffy ball. People say you can even use a soft light. When I you know when you use a for, for shining or eliciting blink response, we can use the regular torch. But if you want to use the same torch for vision testing, you need to put a soft cloth or a white sheet to make it a little softer or simple in the examination. You carry a red fluffy ball. You keep this about 10 to 12 inches from the baby. A baby who's more than 34 weeks will be able to fix his gaze and just follow it up to 45. So he will be able to visualize it. So if you put a soft light, he will look at the light and then he might show some you know, response to say he's able to fix and just follow it up to 45. A term baby obviously will do it much more, but any baby who's more than 34 weeks will be able to fix and follow up to 45 degree if you are showing any soft light or a red fluffy ball at 10 to 12 inches. This is your uh, surrogate for doing a proper vision test in older children. We are just doing this by what else can we do? What we do? I've just put is what to do is what is expected and what is the response. I put it as a second. I think that way, I think it's easy for you to remember what is to be done and what is the response. So we do expect you to do a simple fundoscopy examination. I know in examination with that short time, you may not be able to dilate the eye and do, but at least try to do elicit at least a red eye reflex if you can do it. If not a detail, but if you can just quickly if the child cooperates and if you're able to see that is what is important is unlike a very bright orangish or yellowish orange disc that you see in older child, you may not see that this will be slightly pale or grayish in newborns. That is normal finding. So don't get worried. You can say the disc look lightly pale and you can say this is normal for this baby, especially if it's more preterm. So that's why it's become a little difficult when you look at the babies funders, the other things that you are expected to look for, or if the examiner asks you, what are the findings that you want to see? Your answer should be, I'm looking for evidence of optic atrophy. I'm not going to the DDs of optic atrophy. Features of chorioretinitis, chorioretinitis, which tells you probably an underlying torch infection. Presence of retinal hemorrhage, which is, could be very, very common finding if the baby has had a normal vaginal delivery. So we're trying to look for it. And whether you are able to successfully do it in the examination is a secondary thing, but at least you need to make an attempt to look at the funders. And if the examiner asks you, what are the things that you wanted to see? I think this is an option. Because the disc is very pale, sometimes it's very difficult to pick up optic atrophy, but I think looking into find other features, you could differentiate, but because of a pale disc, sometimes it might be a little difficult for you. So these are the three things. Eliciting a blink response, having a fluffy red ball and trying to see whether the baby fixes the gaze and trying to do fundus examination are the three things that you do as a part of your optic nerve examination. Third, fourth, and sixth are something which you club and do it together, but they all have got to do with the normal ocular movements. What do you do? First, you see, you just assess the baby. Does he have any ptosis, any asymmetry? Spontaneous eye movements. Is the child moving the eye spontaneously? Does there is any disconjugate movements? Is there a symmetry in the movements? Normally, what do I expect? There should not be any difference in the palpable fissures. There should not be any ptosis or any lag of thalamus. There should be a good eye movements and the, there should be a symmetrical eye movements that I should be able to see. That is what I'm expecting to see what is normal. What is that I'm looking for? What abnormality can have? There could be limitation of eye movement. Let's say this baby has a sixth nerve palsy. You just observe and you see this baby is not moving the eye towards that side. That it's not having the lateral movements on that eye and that this baby is otherwise moving the other side quite well, but there is a limitation. There could be a gaze palsy. When you're trying to look around, the baby is not trying to have a very symmetrical movements. So a gaze palsy, horizontal gaze palsy can be seen even in severe HR. So your vertical gaze palsy is very, very rare in the newborn period. Horizontal gaze palsy is what you commonly can see as well. So is the child not able to move in particular direction or does he have limitation of eye movements in one particular eye is what you are trying to look for even before you test it. What else can I do? Simple pupillary right response using again the light. 
less than 28 to 30 weeks, baby will not have a pupillary response. The pupils do not react to the light when they are less than 30 weeks, but by 30 weeks, you should be able to get a decent pupillary reaction. It sort of matures by about 32 weeks and beyond when you get a proper bilateral pupillary eye disease. What is the abnormality you're looking at? If there is any unilateral meiosis or any unilateral constriction of the eye or unilateral dilatation, you can see it in Horner syndromes. You can, you can see if there's an injury to the particular one particular nerve as such. Bilaterally constricted pupils, you can see if the baby is in HI stage two. Bilateral dilated pupils can be seen if the baby is in stage one. Basically, sympathetic overactivity will cause dilated eyes. If it's parasympathetic, you get bilaterally constricted. So you, all I'm trying to make you uh, make things simplify is what is the response? What is that you are supposed to check? What is a normal response and what are the abnormalities that you are going to see? How do I test the eye movements? As I told, when you have that the red fluffy ball, it will just fix the gaze. It will not move his eyes on both the direction when you do it because th that, that response comes only by about three months of age. In a newborn period, how do I know the baby is moving the eyes in thing? It is by simple doll's eye manual. What do you mean by doll's eye manual is, I do not know how many of us have uh, uh, remember those uh, toys. I don't see them, and uh, I know uh, nowadays. But as a child, I remember uh, my 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 cousins, sisters, and used to have that doll. Which when you move the position, the eye used to go up and down. You know, it is like when you put the baby's head down, the eye used to come down like this. When you do this, the eye used to go up. So we used to be very amused with that movement. And and I think the dolls I came with that background that these dolls which the move the head and there's to this eye used to go up and down with the movement of the head. And that is why they used to call us a doll's eye manual. What you do simple is just rotate the head to side to side and see what is the response of the eye in relation to the head. When I turn the head to one side, the eyes moves to the opposite side. That is what it means. If you turn the head to right side, the eyes moves to the left. You move the head to the left, the eyes move to the right. This is normal. This is seen till about two to three months of age when the macular fixation occurs. Subsequently, you will not be able to elicit doll's eye manual. This is a simple thing that I'm trying to show here. What I'm trying to show, the baby's head is turned to one side and eyes has moved to the opposite side. So you gently hold the head and you move the head to one side and move to the head to the other side when the eyes are open and to try to quickly demonstrate. The same thing you can do by moving the head up and down. I found that little difficult to do it because when you're trying to move up and down, you may not be able to clearly visualize it, but at least from side to side, you should be able to easily demonstrate in the examination. If they ask you what demonstrate doll side, you need to gently see when the baby is awake, just quickly move the head to one side and to the other side. And the response that you're looking is the eye moving into the opposite direction. The fifth cranial nerve or trigeminal nerve, there are the sensory component and the motor component. What a simple thing is when you do rooting reflex, you are actually checking the sensory part of the trigeminal nerve. So a normal rooting reflex means the baby is able to feel the sensations good enough for you to say the sensory part is normal. And when the baby is sucking, you need a good masseters and pterygoids, which tells you that if the baby is effectively sucking and if you're able to feel the masseters, that means this baby's motor component of trigeminal is normal. So sensory is tested by rooting. Motor is tested when you are checking the masseters in the, doing the sucking. Books say you can do corneal reflex. I, 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 I really feel in the exams, we do not expect you to do that because every candidate coming and doing corneal response is not expected. Simple rooting and sucking is good enough for you to demonstrate the sensory and the motor component of trigeminal. Seventh cranial nerve, what do I do? I just observe the facial symmetry at rest and when the child is crying. Basically, I'm trying to look for the forehead wrinkling. I'm trying to look at the nasolabial fluids. I'm trying to look at whether the angle of mouth gets deviated when the baby is crying. What do I see? What I'm supposed to see? There should not be any asymmetry of the palpable fissure. That means when the child is closing eye, one is wide open, one is smaller. That means this is the affected eye. There is a lag of problems. 
If there is absence of nasal level fold on one side, that means that side is the abnormal side. There is a facial nerve passing. The deviation of angle to the mouth, the mouth deviates to the normal side and the side where you are having a wide palpable pressure, absence of nasal fluids or deviation to the opposite side, you know that side is the affected side. So a seventh cranial nerve is very simple. You just need to see the baby at rest, look for the wrinkles, look for at least the wrinkle may not be easily seen, nasolabial folds and deviation of angle of mouth during crying are two important things that you need to tell the examiner saying that I did not see any absence of nasal folds. There was no deviation of angle of mouth to either of the side. I feel the seventh nerve is normal, is enough for you in the examination. Eighth cranial nerve, what do you do? I said you need a bell, gently ring the bell or you can do a gentle clap, don't make loud noises. A baby who is more than 28 weeks will just show a quick blink or start. A term baby, if you're making a gentle noise, may show cessation of motor. He's very fretful, you make noise, he suddenly might become quiet. Or he's quiet, you make a sound, he might show a change in the motor activity. He could start breathing faster, he could open his mouth and eyes wide open saying that, oh, I did hear something. So that can be seen only in term babies, in a preterm babies in the exams, even if you make a noise, you're able to demonstrate a start and you can tell the examiner, I rang a bell and this baby could have a good startle. I feel the eight nerve is normal. Now, just a word of caution is, you may not get a very consistent, the child is fast asleep and you try to respond, he may not respond, or there could be just a vernix blocking the ears, you may not get a response does not necessarily mean the child is having absent hearing. You can make a note of it. You can repeat an examination, but we always say this hearing in a newborn period clinically is a very difficult uh, pain love to test. And whenever in a doubt or as a routine protocol, we do ask for audiometry or you know uh, evoked brainstem responses or auditory brainstem evoked response ABR, which was done routinely at three months. But whenever in a doubt, you're trying to say, repeatedly do that and you didn't see any startle, you didn't see any change in the motor activity or behavior of the baby, you can tell the examiner, I did not find a consistent response. I would be happy to get a Bera test done on this baby to rule out eight no. That is what is expected to tell in the examination. Ninth, 10th and 12th Kirin love is very simple. You just observe the baby when baby is sucking and swallowing, either on a pacifier or on the breastfeeding. What is important is a baby who's more than 34 weeks will have an effective sucking. What do you need by effective sucking? You need actually trigeminal nerve, you need seventh cranial nerve, you need ninth cranial nerve, you need 10th cranial nerve for a good suck swallow coordination, and you need a 12th cranial nerve to have an effective suckling. So what it means is if the baby is able to effectively suck and swallow his fifth nerve, his seventh nerve, his ninth nerve, his tenth nerve, and his twelfth nerve are all normal. They should be effective sucking. The baby should not be having any drooling. The baby should not be having any episodes of choking or cough, which tells you the suck-swallow coordination is not, not very good and that the baby is aspirating. You can do a gag reflex, which normally we don't expect it to. Simple tongue depressor, go touch the posterior pharyngeal wall, look for liftment of uvulva, not normally. Or even if you don't in the exam, it's completely okay. But know that gag reflex could be one of the things that you want to test for ninth and 10th grade. Now. Tongue, when the tongue is at rest, just observe for any asymmetry or any fasciculation, which is typically seen when the baby's tongue is at rest. We cannot ask the baby to protrude the tongue, look for deviation. But at least if there's any asymmetry that you see, one side is looking a little thinner, one side is looking you know, normal in size, or if you're seeing any fasciculations, which could be a sign of spinal muscular atrophy. So you can just gently look at the tongue. But the basic examination of 9th, 10th, and 12th can be done. If you are able to observe the baby, you can tell in the exam, I observed the baby on breastfeeding, the baby was able to effectively suck, or you gave a pacifier, uh, whether you should use your fingers to do that, uh, ideally no, because you are worried that whether you would, uh, you know, or if examiner definitely demonstrate whether you can wash your hands, wear a gloves and document, fair enough, but simple will be to use a simple pacifier or ask the brother to breastfeed, much, much simpler thing to do. 11th cranial nerve, the spinal part of cranial, very simple, just ask, gently turn the head to one side to other side and just look at the shoulder height. What do you expect? The head to turn to one side to other without any difficulty. The shoulder should be symmetrical. You can gently palpate the sternocleidomastite. The muscle mass is normal on both the sides. You can say the 11th nerve is normal. 
So you have done all the cranial nerve examination without disturbing the baby too much by simple observation and doing simple tests. I hope this was the most, uh, I would say the simplified version of cranial nerve examination I've tried to put in the slides. I hope that, that that's very, very easily understood by most of you. So it's not very difficult to do all the cranial nerve. I think this is uh, uh, the simplest uh, format that I have been able to put and, and try to make things very, very easy for you to elicit and probably remember this in the exams. As we always say, breastfeeding, one, one complete observation. In the examination, you didn't find anything. You said, sir, I observed the baby when he was breastfeeding. I think most of the cranial nerves are normal. What this means is if the baby is able to turn towards the breast with the smell of breast milk, you have tested your first cranial nerve. When a baby's mother is trying to talk to the baby, the baby fixes the gaze on the mother, the second cranial nerve is tested. Baby is able to effectively suckle, that means you are, that, sorry, if the baby is able to have a good rooting, it means you have tested the sensory part. If the baby is effectively suck, you have tested the motor part of fifth cranial nerve, you have tested the seventh cranial nerve, you have tested your ninth, tenth, you have tested your twelfth cranial nerve exam. He is able to turn his head towards that side. You have even tested this final part of the 11th cranial nerve. So we see a simple act that you observe when the baby is breastfeeding. You could tell the examiner that he did a lot of things. And I think the baby is grossly good with most of the cranial nerves. The only thing you will not have uh, done is the, uh, the hearing part. Even that if the mother is able to gently speak and the baby shows some kind of a response, you could even tell the eighth cranial nerve is normal. So one act of this observation of the baby going on to breastfeeding is a very beautiful or a simple way to assess most of your cranial nerves. This is just a summary of what I've spoken and not go to this. I hope that that completes the first step in the, the second step, I would say. You've done the level of alertness and now you've done the cranial Now I'm coming to the motor system proper. Again, I've tried to make things a little simple for you so that you can carry this information in the exam. Motor system, we are testing the resting posture, passive tone, active tone, dependent reflexes. I have what I have put today is a very simplistic versions of all this. Uh, there are, I will come to it, there are um, structured formats. You don't get into that in real life. I think this is the most important aspects of motor system examination. And this is very, very crucial for you may not see that much of cranial abnormalities. But in and out that you're definitely going to see in your life is tone, tone, tone abnormalities. So all of you should be able to assess the tone properly in the examination. All we expect at the end of your examination is when you look at the posture, you do passive tone, you do active tone. We do expect out of once you've done all these three and along with deep tendon reflexes, tell the examiner this baby's tone is normal. This baby's tone is hypotonia. This baby's tone is hypertonic. If at the end of these three examination or this four examination, if you could tell me clearly tell us whether the baby's tone is normal, hypo or hyper, I think we'll give you full marks. We might ask you to demonstrate one or two to prove your point. And if you're able to do, you are through your CNS examination. You do not get much abnormality in the sensory system. You do not get very rarely you get cranial nerve exam abnormalities, but you definitely get a baby who's got tone abnormality. So uh, I've, once I present during your discussion, please feel free to discuss. Let me know if you have got any queries, I'll be more than happy to answer. What basically you mean by tone is it is a constant contraction, a mild contraction that is seen in the muscles, which is important for the baby to maintain the posture anti-gravity. That is what this definition of the tone means. So what do we do? We observe the tone in the resting posture. First, we do not start the examination. If I have been asked to check, if the examiner tells you, please do motor system examination, I will just stand for 30 seconds. I will tell, sir, I'm going to observe the resting posture. This is the first step in assessing the tone. What is important to understand is the passive tone matures with gestational age and follows a chordocephalic direction. What it means is a 28 weeker will have extended, all the four limbs will be extended as the gestation matures, the baby starts acquiring the tone. The baby starts getting little flex tone in the lower limbs first. He will start getting little flexion at the knee and hip at 32 to 34 weeks. 
then he will start getting good flexion in the lower limb then he start getting mild flexion in the upper limb and when he comes to term there is a good tone or he has achieved a good flexor tone at the end of 40 weeks so a 28 weeker will have a very extensor he does not acquire enough tone he looks very you know the limbs are in a completely extended posture when you come to 40 weeks you have achieved a complete flexion posture interesting is when you follow up these babies at three months six months and nine months he again becomes little hypotonic there is physiological hypotonia at around nine to twelve months so it's a very interesting journey for a 28 weeker who starts with a popliteal of 180 degree at 28 weeks comes to 90 degree and again becomes 150 to 180 degree when it becomes 9 to 12 months so very interesting journey of a 28 weeker who's started whom you have followed up from day one if you follow him at one year you will have this maturation so please understand a tone is going to mature and he acquires a complete flexor tone at the time when he's 40 weeks but again becomes slightly hypotonic on follow -up. i hope i'm making this sense so what what i mean when i how do i assess the resting posture there are a few things that you need to make sure if the head is turned to one side you turn the head to the center because if his head is turned to one side you could be eliciting a tonic reflex and you might have the opposite that side limping extended giving you a different tone so you need to have a head in center you need to have the baby in supine you just stand there look at the limb position and limb movements and another important aspect of resting posture is to look for the thumb because the neonate at, at, at birth might have this flexed or what we call cortical thumb, but at by about a month, he should start or even in newborn period, he should be intermittently opening his thumb, constantly keeping the fisting like this, even at one month, two months or three months he is again a cortical thumb or a sign of early evolving cerebral palsy. So about the thumb position, what is important is at term, it is just holding it like this, but intermittently opening up. By about one month, he started to open up his palms. By two to three months, he should be able to open up palm because he's trying to have a voluntary gasp. But if the baby at two months, three months, you constantly see him in this position, it means this is probably one of the early signs of evolving tone abnormality of cerebral palsy. That's about the thumb. Otherwise, you are going to look at the limb position. So this is what I was trying to talk to you. If you look at this baby, this baby has acquired little flexion in the lower limb, but the upper limb flexion tone has not yet been achieved. I think this baby is around 34 to 35 weeks. If you see a 28 weeker, this limbs will be completely extended. The upper limb will be completely extended. Now he's around 34 to 36. He's acquired flexion at the level of knee and hip, but he's still having some extension of very mild flexion. But if you look at a term, baby has acquired a completely flexion. This is what I meant when he said, Chordocephalic. That means it's coming from the limbs towards the center. And this is how the, the passive tone matures from 28 weeks to 40 weeks. What did we do? We do passive tone and we do active tone. What did we do passive tone for? We do passive tone for the limbs. When I mean passive, are you passive? No, you're not passive. The baby is passive. The baby is not doing anything. You are trying to do some maneuvers. When the baby is at rest, when he is very passive, you are trying to do some manures and you are trying to elicit the tone by trying to do some manures. Now, this passive tone assessment or manures are a very important component of your Amyl Tyson's clinical methods of assessing tone. This is the basis for assessing the tone in Amyl Tyson's method. I am not going in depth to Amyl Tyson's, but I am trying to make you understand what it means by passive tone. So what do you mean by passive tone? Who's passive here? The baby is passive. Who's active here? The examiner is active. What are you trying to do? Elicit some maps. Now, the simple word of caution is when you're trying, when in the exams, we ask you to demonstrate popliteal, be very slow, gentle. You're not supposed to force the limbs. You're not supposed to uh, make the angles normal. You're just trying to make, assess and trying to see what is the tone the baby has achieved. You can't do it if you're trying to put more pressure and trying to achieve the no. You are trying to just see to what level the baby is able to make it. So when you're doing this popliteal or adductor, whatever angles you want to do, you have to be very gentle. You're just going to go by what the baby is capable of, not what you are capable of. A 28 weeker, I'm, I can't forcefully make the angles. 
I am just important as far as Volpe is also concerned. He talks of only three things, popliteal, scarf, and heel to ear. And, you know, he says there are not too much of information that he, that you can elicit even if you do many more. But you could do a lot more angles. And as I told you, amalgamation is a very structured examination that you can do where all the angles can be done. But do we need to do all the angles? To me, there is one angle for lower limb, one angle for upper limb. If you can just do this properly and come out and tell me, sir, there is lower limb is normal, upper limb is normal. That is all information that I'm going to acquire in that quick short examination that I'm going to do. If I'm doing it as a part of my research and I, I, have, I want to do a detail, I can have a lot of structured examinations. Your Brazilians, I mean, Hammersmith, your, your Dubovitz, all of them basically have this tone as one of the important aspects of their evaluation of the newborn neonatal neurological evaluation, right? But just understand the basis for it. The basis is that everybody wants to know whether the baby's tone is normal or abnormal. Can I do it by doing simple angles? Yes, you can do it. Simple thing is do popliteal angle, do scarf sign for the upper limb. What exactly do in popliteal angle? You gently first, you can do one limb at a time or you can do both the limbs. You just need to first gently put the thigh onto the abdomen and try to stretch the, you are trying to stretch the leg and at the level of, so don't you are trying to assess it at the level of knee. What is this instrument that you're saying? This is a goniometer, ideally speaking, because this becomes very arbitrary. No, it looks 90, it looks 180. Uh, you are very good at your geometry. You can roughly tell the angles, but if you are not too sure, you can carry this simple goniometer. I think these are available in most of the shops. Uh, our hospital uh, uh, the bookshop has this goniometer available. I think the physiotherapists, they regularly use this. And you know the angles are documented here. There is one, two limbs, one is across the thigh and one she's holding it here and the angle is measured here. So this is a term baby. She's trying to show you an angle of around 90 degrees. So in popliteal, what you're trying to measure is you're putting the thigh onto the abdomen, close to the abdomen, and then gently trying to extend at the level of knee and trying to measure the angle between the leg and the between this part and to the thigh and that angle is what we are talking about as a popliteal angle. It's a popliteal fossa that we are talking about. The angle that is formed at that place is why we are calling it as popliteal angle. Easy to remember. A 28 weaker, as I told, is completely hypotonic. His angles will be around 150 degree. By 32 to 34, it becomes around 120 degree. At 40 weeks, this is about 90 degree. Again, when you do it on follow-up at three months, it can still become around 90 to 100 degrees. At six months, it can be about 100 to 120 degrees. At nine months, again, it comes to 120 to 150 degrees. So the popliteal angle can be done from 28 weeks to term, and it can be followed up when you're doing this, following up this babies in your OPD as a high risk follow up. So you just need to remember this angle coming from 120 to 90, and again going from 90 to 150. That's the uh, journey I was talking about. What do you mean by scarf sign? This is a scarf. You're trying to put a scarf around your neck. That's what it means. You're gently trying to pull the arm to the opposite shoulder. You are, you are trying to pull that arm towards opposite shoulder. What you're trying to see is the relation of this elbow in relation, in relation to the midline. At 28 weeker, you can actually pull this elbow almost to the opposite shoulder. As you mature, if this is a term baby, you are just medial to the midline. At term, you are just medial to the midline. At around three months, you are still somewhere close to it. At six months, you reach the midline. At nine months, you cross the midline. So again, a 28 weeker, you are able to cross the midline. Then it comes to midline. Then it comes to medial to midline. And when you are following up at three, six, and nine, again, the scar sign angle improves. Okay. So I am, I'm just telling you two important uh, uh, the signs that are uh, the angles that you should be eliciting and this. So what happens if you are, if, if the baby is hypotonic, this angles, let's say, how do I know the baby is hypotonic? At 40 weeks, instead of being at 90, the angle is 120 degree at the end of 40 weeks. You are seeing a baby whose preterm now corrected age is 40 weeks and his angle is coming up to 120, 130. What it means is this tone is less. That means this baby is hypotone. 
let's say at 40 weeks my angles are only about 30 40 degree i'm unable to extend the knee the knees are very stiff it means the baby is hypertonic so more acute the angle it means the baby is hypertonic the angles are more for that age it means it is hypotonic at 3 months i said the angle should be 90 to 100 at 3 months you are still seeing 70 to 80 degree it means it is hypertonic at 3 months you are seeing 150 degree it means baby is hypotonic I hope I'm making that point very clear. Scarf sign, if the baby you're able to cross the midline at term, the baby is hypertonic. You are not able to cross the midline even at six months, the baby is hypertonic. So hypertonic, the babies are stiffer, the angles are shorter, I mean acute. The baby is hypotonic, the angles are more wider or it is more than the expected age. I think that is the point all of you should be understand. I hope I'm making myself very, very clear. You have specific angles for each age from 28 weeks to 40 weeks and even beyond that at three, six, nine months. Angles at that age, if it's appropriate, you say tone is normal. If the angle is more than expected, you say baby is hypotonic. If the angles are less than expected, you say baby is hypertonic. So once you finish this, you look at the tone, uh, resting tone, and you look at the angles, you say baby's tone is normal or the other passive angles people have commonly spoken is heel to ear. When you first extend the leg and try to bring the heel towards the ear and as the baby matures at term, it's around 90 degree. And as the baby matures, it, it keeps coming closer and closer to the ears. So you are trying to measure the distance between the heel and ear. Adductor angle, you can try to do between the thighs. You are measuring the angle there and dorsiflexion of foot. You are just trying to pass flex. So these are other angles that you can do. But even if you do do proper angles in the exams, that's good enough. You need to know about other angles. You need to know the values for it. I, I think if, if time permits, I'll share those values also. With you. But at least if you're able to do that popliteal and scarf sign properly and interpret this properly, it is more than enough for us. As I told you, you can go on and on. There are structured formats. There are structured examination methods. If your, if your center is used to a particular structured methods, you could adapt that in the exams. And you say, based on this, I'm going to score. And based on this, I will tell you. But ultimately, whether you follow a structured format or a simple format, if you can tell me at, your, at the end of your examination, is the baby normal, hyper, or hyper, I think that's more than enough for me. Active tone is basically done to look at the axial. That means the head and trunk. Who's active here? Here the baby is active. You are not very active here. You are trying to elicit and you are trying to look for the response. Three things that we do. Pull to sit, horizontal suspension, and vertical suspension. So we did two angles. You can add other one or two angles if you wish to. And three active tone assessment, which we are doing basically for the axial tone. What exactly do in pull to sit? You are holding the baby by the wrist and gently pulling the baby towards you. What do you expect if the tone is normal? For a term baby, the head comes along with the body for some time and then after momentary holding the head, the head might fall back or come in the front. And there should be some traction or some traction at the level of the elbows. You should be able to feel little traction at the elbow and the head should be in the midline for some time. Then subsequently it might fall backwards or forwards if you hold it for a very long time. This demonstrates this baby is hypotonic. You are not seeing any traction here that is completely lacked. This means there is a head lag or the baby is probably hypotonic. What can happen if there is hypertonia? The baby could be virtually arching. Even the trunk gets arched and the baby's head goes backwards and the baby's limb tone looks very high and he tries to be going. Or sometimes if it's hypertonic, he, when you try to pull, he might come right in before even the head, the body comes in. That tells you there is the, probably there is too much of income and there is increased tone. If the head is lagging behind, there's no traction noted at the level of elbow. This means the baby is hypotonic. So at the end of this pull to sit, you should be able to differentiate. You should be able to write there. Normal response, hypotonia or a hypertonia. What do you do in horizontal suspension? You gently hold the baby by abdomen. And again, try to see, gently, momentarily leave the baby and see. What do I expect? Flexion at the level of elbow, flexion at the level of knee, flexion at level of hip, head in center with the body. This is the spine 
I expect the head to momentarily held there and again slowly come down, head up, come down, go up and come down. He should be able to maintain the head in the midline momentarily. There should be flexion at the level of the upper limbs and lower limbs at the level of elbow, knee and hip. If the baby is hypotonic, the head will be falling, the dangling, the arms are dangling. We say the baby gets wrapped around your hand. He's passively falling down. The limbs are dangling. The head is falling down. Baby is hypotonic. If the baby is lifting the head up, he's arching, his spine is arching, his limbs are showing extension, baby is hypertonic. So when you say horizontal suspension, again, you need to interpret say baby is wrong, normal, baby is hyper or showing hypotonic. Vertical suspension, you try to hold the baby and try to see what happens. Normally with a good shoulder strength, the baby should be resting himself onto your arms. He should be resting himself with the arm and he should be showing some flexion of the legs. He should be able to hold the head. If he's hypotonic, you feel as if he's slipping. He doesn't show enough strength in the shoulder. He tries to slip between your hands and the limbs will be dangling. What will happen if there is hypertonia? He will be having scissoring in the lower limb. He will be trying to arch. He might show you the signs of the arching and you know this baby is hypertonic. So this is whatever I've described is for the term babies. This is the response that you expect. Deep tendon reflexes, easy. Should I do all the possible deep tendon reflexes? You may not. You might want to do uh, a clearly a DTR, an ankle and biceps. Uh, you can, I mean, ideally you should keep your finger here and tap your finger or very gently you need to tap. This is a kind of hammer I was talking about, not those the triangle base, which are very hurtful. This round, you get the small pediatric one, gently tap and you look for the response. You grade them based on zero, has no response. The baby is hypotonic, is having absent reflexes, is depressed. It's just barely elicitable. Brisk response is normal. That means easily elicitable DTRs are normal. If it is symmetrical and you are getting a brisk reflex, it is normal. So we normally tell our postgraduates, a neonatal reflex or neonatal DTR should be easily elicitable. That means they should normally little brisk, which is normal. A very brisk could be abnormal, but again, if it is asymmetrical, you need to be a little careful about it. And clonus can be normally seen. An ankle clonus or patella are easily to demonstrate is ankle clonus. You just do the dorsiflexion and about five to 10 jerks of clonus can be normal in a newborn, but beyond three months, even if it is clonus is persisting, we take it as abnormal. So you could get a clonus normal, but a repeated clonus, if it's only on one limb, it can be abnormal. Or if it's persisting beyond first two to three months, it could be abnormal. But a clonus, ankle clonus can be normally seen in a newborn period. So unlike older children, what you need to understand is a brisk DTR is normal as long as it is symmetrical. A clonus could be normally seen in a term neonate but should disappear by three months of age. A big confusion about superficial reflexes. Should we do plantar response in newborn? Is it extensor? As an undergraduate, we were told, oh, the normal response in newborn is extensor due to lack of myelination. But if you read Olpe carefully, they said if elicitated appropriately, there should be a flexor response in most of the newborns. Why there is a confusion, whether it's flexor or extensor, I can elicit plantar and elicit a flexor response if I wish to. If I want to elicit extensor, I can do it. Why it is, there is a confusion is there are four competing reflexes acting at when you're doing plantar response. There are two reflexes which will cause extensor response. Nociceptive withdrawal and contact avoidance. Nociceptive withdrawal means if I elicit the plantar using a very sharp object, I will elicit an extensor response. That is a mistake that we used to do. You know, in adults, we were told to remove that, the back of our knee hammer and use that sharp or use our keys to do it. If you elicit, give a painful stimuli, there is a nociceptive withdrawal which cause extensor response. Contact avoidance, if you keep touching the dorsum of the feet, it will show you extensor response. And that is what we commonly, we, are, we, we always are taught to hold the limb and when you hold the dorsum of the feet, it will constantly show a extensor response. So contact avoidance, one response, 
and noises have to withdraw the response. If you elicit a very painful response, you are holding the dorsum, you'll get extensor response. No, I've been very gentle. I didn't touch the dorsum and I'm using a very blunt object just to stroke the extent, the, the outer part of the leg, you will get, and if you come closer to the toes, you will get a plantar grasp. You will get a flexor response. And if you are getting some pressure here, when you're doing eliciting, you will get positive support reaction. Both of them can elicit flexor response. So what it means is, if I give very painful, I can get extensor response. If I do what we do in adults, bringing into the, the, the just below the toes, you will get the flexor response. Both of them are not an appropriate. That means both are normal. You, so you cannot say whether flexor response is normal, extensor, depending on what you have elicited. But you still want to be very accurate and tell me oh, how can I do without getting all these reflexes is using a very blunt object and just stroking the lateral part of the leg of the sole, sorry, and not coming just in this part of the great toes. And if you are not, don't touch the dorsum of the feet, I think you will get a normal flexor response. So this is the reason why there is a confusion when you elicit plantar response. So Volpe, if you read, he says, because of this, he may not have a lot of meaningful information from plantar. Should we do abdominal reflex, cremastic reflex and all? I do not think in newborn period we expected to do all that and doesn't add much value to your neurological examination. Primitive reflexes, what are primitive reflexes? Primitive reflexes are the reflexes that you see at birth they're all coming from the brainstem. They're all brainstem reflexes. This reflexes, abnormalities in reflexes, absent of this reflexes in the newborn period tells you there is something wrong with the brainstem and cortex or persistent of this reflex beyond three months or six months of age tells you what exactly happens is at birth, all these primitive reflexes are normally seen. They're all brainstem reflexes. As you evolve, as you come up to three months or six months, your cortex inhibits all these primitive reflexes. So disappearance of these primitive reflexes by three to six months of age is normal. If the reflexes are persisting beyond three to six months of age, that means there's something wrong. The cortex has not been able to inhibit these primitive reflexes. I hope I'm making myself very, very clear. Presence of primitive reflex does not mean anything. It means they are just there. But if the primitive reflexes are not able to elicit, it means baby is neurologically depressed and persistence of neonatal reflexes beyond particular time is again abnormal. It means the cortex, something is wrong with the cortex of this baby. Three important primitive reflexes, which gives a significant information, morose, palmar, and tonic tech reflex. Remember, there are many more neonatal reflexes you kept doing, but they don't add much information to your routine neurological examination. Whatever I'm talking today is something which is very apt for your bedside neurological examination, right? So whatever points I'm talking, it's all relevant for your day-to-day -day bedside clinical examination. So I do moros, I do pramar grasp, I look for ATMR. Placing and stepping reflex doesn't add, you can elicit it, but doesn't add much information to your existing neurological information. Ocular vestibular reflex, moros, what do you do? You gently flex the head and gently drop by 30 degree. And what do you see? You see a sudden response in the form of the abduction, extension, and opening up of hand, fingers or opening up of palms. So this is what we expect when you elicit moros. Moros can be seen even at 28 weeker when they just open the hands and they may not show you complete extension and abduction. By 32 weeks, if you are eliciting moros in a 32 weeker, it will show you some extension and abduction. But at 37 weeks, you will get the flexor component of moros. And remember, moros should disappear by the end of six months. If you're getting a baby's moros, even at six months, there's something seriously wrong, or it means the cortical functions are abnormal. And this baby is probably heading towards some neurological problem. So moros is elicited by gently flexing the head by 30 degree and leaving it quickly and looking for the abduction, extension and opening up of the palms. And as I told you, a different gestation, what is expected. The other important information that you get when you elicit moros, asymmetrical moro. So you get only abduction, extension, opening on only one hand 
the other limb is not moving, there is wrong, something wrong, whether it could be a fracture clavicle, fracture humerus, or it could suggest the baby is having brachial plexus injury. So asymmetrical moro again gives you a lot more information to your neurological fight. Palmar grasp again can be seen as early as 28 weeks. Simple, you try to keep your uh, fingers and you expect the baby to hold on. 28 weeks, it can be just present. You can just see the baby holding. This is a very common reflex when you see mothers coming and touch the baby. The baby holds on. The mothers get very emotional. Oh, my baby held my hand. And we know that's a very simple Palmar grasp that we're talking about. So even a preterm baby can hold on to the mother and it can be there, but it may not be very strong. By 32 weeks, you get reasonably a good grasp. By 37 weeks, the grasp is so strong that you can virtually lift the baby off from the bed. That is what is expected when they are tough. But if the baby at 37, 38 weeks is having a very weak or absent palmar, or the baby is having an absent morose, that means this baby is neurologically depressed. Absent morose or incomplete morose at a term baby means the baby is neurologically abnormal. A weak or absent palmar grass means this baby is neurologically up. It could, a asymmetric moros can tell you more about herbs or brachial plexus injury. A presence or absence of palmar grass will help you to differentiate between the herbs and clump case practices. When should palmar grass disappear? It should disappear by two to three months. Why should it disappear? Because after that, the baby develops voluntary grasp. If the palmar grass persists beyond two to three months, it's abnormal. And it again tells you baby is probably heading towards problem and that he will not be able to develop a voluntary grasp. Tonic rectal effect, simple, turn the head to one side. You turn the head to one side, that side, upper limb and lower limb get well extended. The opposite limbs, the upper limb and lower limb are in flexed. By 35 weeks, you should be able to elicit tonic neck reflex. And again, they should disappear by six months because only when it disappears, the baby is able to develop rollover. If there's a persistent ATNR or atonic asymmetric tonic neck reflex, the baby will not be able to roll over because every time the head turns, the, that side limbs get extended. So they have to disappear by six months. So you understand the neonatal reflexes, the presence is normal. If it is absent, it means the baby is neurologically depressed. The persistence of neonatal reflexes beyond a particular age, again, means the baby's cortical functions are not very well developed. Sensory system examination can be challenging. It's not very easy. I can't uh, ask the baby, oh, are you able to feel the touch or the pain? But I can look at the baby. I can touch. I can see the response. I can do a gentle, painful. I'm very particular about eliciting. The only situation where I can think about is if there's a neural tube and you want to check for the sensory system. That's the only situation where you can get the sensory system involvement is you touch with multiple pricks in the lower limb. What you look for is you can't ask the baby for the pain. You look for the facial response. Does he grimace? Does he show any withdrawal or does he cry? That means the baby's sensory system is normal. You are touching the medial aspect of the lower limbs with the painful pricks and the child is not showing grimace. The child is not showing withdrawal. The child is not crying. That means the child is probably having a absent sensory system. So it's not a very important aspect that you talk about sensory system, but only situation I can think about is when you're having a lower motor neuron type of palsy, the only situation I can see in newborn period is the neural tube effect. The last slide, bear with me. I think I've taken almost one hour, 15 minutes. I just want all of you to know there is something called pressures, general movement assessment. This now is sort of becoming more and more popular. All of you should know about it. Yeah, this in exams, you should be able to tell what it is. Basically, what you are doing here is you're trying to do uh, just looking at the quantity and quality of the gross body movements and trying to score the baby so based on that. This is a very simple thing that we do. You can be doing it from birth. The physiotherapist people think they can do it from 35 weeks onwards, but from birth up to 20 weeks of corrected age, you can use this pressure general movement. It's a very simple non-invasive and non-disruptive. That means you're not doing anything in this. All you're trying to do is you're just observing, I think 20 to 30 seconds in the baby supine. You're not stimulating. You're just looking at the spontaneous movements and based on the quality of movements, you're trying to see whether. What they say is the first six to eight weeks, the baby is having a sort of slow riding, riding type of movements. By about six to nine months, weeks, he starts getting little fidgety movements, which are normal. 
And by 20 weeks, those fidgety movements disappear and it develops a better movement. So what they say is this quality of breathing or the quality of this fidgety movements is what they are trying to assess. And people have tried to correlate and they say with pressures, general motor assessment, they're able to predict evolving CP as good as any good neurological examination or uh, you know, predicting by using MRI. So they have, they have, people have actually done, but only thing is you need training. The training is only to observe the movements. You don't have to do anything. You just, you can even tell the mother to record a 20, 30 seconds of video and send it to you. And you can sit in your home and say whether this baby is at risk for developing neurological problem. So absence of fidgety, you know, appearance of these fidgety movements by about 10 weeks or 12 weeks and based on the quality, I'm not an expert, but all I could understand is based on this movement, they will be able to tell you what is the risk of this baby evolving into CP. Just know that is something called a special general movement element. And now they are saying, we should probably integrate these pressures with your traditional neurological examination, which I have spoken to. So be aware of this, whether you, you need not be an expert, but just understand there is a method like this and it's very simple method and it can be done. But only thing is you need a bit of a training on this aspect. And people have tried to say the sensitivity and specificity of this is very good to predict the evolving C. I, th I think with that, I'm sort of coming to an end of my talk. But uh, the key messages that I want you to, or what I try to do is a very, uh, in a thorough, a very thoughtful. That means you need to know why you're doing a particular thing. How do we interpret that? And very systematic. I, I knew, and I said, which domains I'm going to examine and how those domains help me to reach a meaningful conclusion. At the end of your neurological examination, you need to tell the examiners whether you're dealing with a normal baby, you're dealing with an hypotonic baby, you're dealing with an hypotonic baby, are you dealing with something else? The value of observation should not be under, underestimated as observation alone can provide extensive information on the babies. As I tell you, just standing there and watching the baby for next five, 10 minutes, even without touching, I can tell whether the baby is neurologically normal. I think that's what we do subconsciously when you're in the rounds. You just go and stand next to the baby and you say, I think this baby looks well neurologically. I think this baby is depressed neurologically. What we are doing is subconsciously, we have run through our uh, you know, eyes and we are trying to look at his eyes, when you are trying to look at his movements, when you are trying to his resting posture, we have seen the quality of movement, but without going through it, we say, oh, this baby is normal. Serial examination is important than one point assessment is again, something which I want to re-emphasize. I think, thank you. That's the Bambi thanking me. And this is my own photograph. It's not some photograph downloaded from the Google. So thank you. Uh, I don't know how many people were awake and patiently listening, but but were, were awake throughout my neurological examination. I think thank you very much. And now I'm open for the discussion. Thanks, Pradeep. Thank you very much. That was uh, indeed a brilliant marathon session. I don't know whether you had any water also during this entire time. <laughs> <No. laughs> I, I had taken a bonus dose before I started with the examination. So it was really wonderful. I mean, to continuously speak for 90 minutes uh, is no easy task. And then to make it make things so lucid, clear, uh, really speaks volumes of you as a teacher. Thank you very much, Pradeep. Uh, and there were 75 people till the end. Wow. Okay, so, so that's a huge number. There has been a lot of questions in the chat. Yeah. So, would you be able to see and go through them yeah, one if you don't mind? Uh, okay. So, and then uh, once we finish the questions in the chat, yeah. if you are up to it. We will take any more questions which are there. <laughs> okay. Can I now take a sip of water before I answer? Absolutely. Yeah. Now, uh, uh, first question is from Rizwana Sayats. Sir, please tell various ways to assess whether habituation is present or not. Simple thing I would expect is when you're doing the light reflex, just do the right reflex, see the blink response. Five times blink is present, six, seven times blink response absent is a very simple thing. Sound is a little difficult. I think the simplest thing is that or glabella tap. There are two simple things that you can do. Four to five times response is normal. Beyond that, the baby should stop responding. I hope that answers your question. A child with, with what is it, with his hair may pour root and suck. So in cranial nerve examination or neurological examination, how we mention our finding, please can you give a sample summary of CNX examination of HIE unit, sir? I think the whole presentation was based on that. 
So again, uh, when you are saying rooting and sucking, we are overall talking about a baby who's neurologically depressed. You can just say, baby, when I tried to do a rooting or sucking, baby did not have a good rooting or sucking. This means baby is neurologically depressed. That is all you need to take. You're not talking about a specific cranial nerve. You're talking about overall a baby who's neurologically depressed. The sample summary of an HI baby is again the same headings. You're going to still say, Level of alertness, let's say I'm talking about an HI stage 2 baby. I'll just quickly say the baby's resting posture is a term baby. Sir, he's having a hypotonic posture. He's looking like a 28 weeker. That means his extensor tone or extensor at the level of lower limb and upper limb. His spontaneous activity is less. You are trying to elicit the cranial nerves. He was not showing any interest or he was not showing any, uh, you know, interest to have a sucking, rooting. You could not, you say the baby was neurologically depressed. The, I could not elicit the specific cranial nerves. Motor system examination is very, very important. Again, you say resting posture. You do your passive tone and active tone. The baby will be able to show you signs of hypotonia. The reflexes, the primitive reflexes will be absent. The DTR could be brisk or exaggerated. The primitive reflex will be depressed or incomplete or absent. Right? So that is how you are going to put your, I'm talking typically of an HI stage one. So the format will remain the same, but you can, you know, put the findings in that specific areas. I hope that answers your question. While doing passive tone, angle scarves, and many times the neonate resist. How do we know at which point exactly end up passive tone? So what is important is if the baby is highly irritable, if the baby is uh, highly irritable or the baby is, uh, you know, in a very hypotonic, the point at which you meet resistance, you need to stop. If the baby is crying and you're not trying to do pop little when the baby is crying because he's going to resist. So you want to wait for the baby to calm down. You ask the mother to pacify the baby or maybe feed the baby. Once the baby calms down, you redo that examination. So the point, I don't know if you want to ask is if the baby is crying and trying to hold it voluntarily, does it make sense to do the passive tone? No, you need to wait for the baby to calm down. At till what point do I push it? Till I meet that resistance. At one point I feel, you know, the baby is not allowing me. I can push it beyond at with my strength. No, we are not looking at how much tone you have got. We are trying to see how much tone the baby has got. I hope that answers your question. So development loss is maturation is always cephalocaudal, but in tone maturation, exactly other way around. This is how the myelination happens. And when after term, when we are talking about subsequent at 3, 6, 9, 12, it is going in a cephalocaudal. This is how the cortical organization or maturation happens and subsequently how the brain evolves. Sir, can you evaluate, elaborate on difference between response of starter reflex and morose? Startle response is usually what we say in morose is you need to look at all the three aspects, the adduction, extension, and opening up of the hands, which is not commonly seen. Startle, we are just getting, you don't get the flexor component. You don't get the flexor or let's say adductor component is not there, flexion component is not there. All you have is only the extensor response and baby starting to do that and that's the major difference. So he's only doing opening hands and crying, but he's not showing the flexion as such. Okay, I hope that answers your questions. Uh, thank you. So where would you include motor as moment assessment? Or if you're talking about pressure, general motor, is it once you finish your traditional examination and then you say uh, the general motor score was also this, right? So it is after you finish your traditional examination, it is not before that, okay? Okay, is there something called as physiological squint? Yes, I didn't go into the details of the quality eye. Some amount of squint or squid deviation can be normal, but uh, most of them are intermittent and they all disappear once the baby is about a month old. I, I didn't go into the details just to keep things simple. Uh, sir, quick neurological examination, depressed at babies and a ventilator support. How do we do it, sir? I think it's much simpler because you have an excuse to say, if the baby is on ventilator, let's say this is a baby who's asphyxiated on ventilator, I think I can take an excuse to tell the examiner, so the baby was on ventilator, he was, you know, so I could not do a detailed neurological examination, but I could quickly assess his tone or the resting posture. So the resting posture was looking hypotonic, the baby was completely looking like a pitted frog. I could quickly do a palmar grasp or the plantar grasp, which were looking depressed or incomplete. If 
permitted, I could do a gentle morose, but if it's on ventilator, I would probably expect you not to do that. Simple routing, if at all, there is no plasters, you can do it. But otherwise, I think simple commenting on resting postures, commenting on one or two neonatal reflexes, primitive reflexes, and simple DTR is all you can say. Neurological examination in terms of alertness, spontaneous movements and activity, if the baby has not been on anticonvulsants, you could comment on it. But in the exams, you can politely tell baby was on phenobarbitone, baby is on ventilator, baby is on sedation. All information that you try to quote is only the resting posture. The baby is not on sedation. You could add his spontaneous movements. You could comment on palmar grass, plantar grass. You could do DTR and you can tell, sir, once the baby is out of the ventilator, I would like to do a detailed neurological examination. Is that acceptable, Suman? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Pupil response should be, be eliciting only if the eyes are open. Yes, forcefully trying to open the eyes. Many times they try to forcefully close. So just wait, gently try to roll the baby, open the eyes and then try to do it. And the other uh, tip is don't use very bright light because that will again cause blink response. Hammer Smith score, can you say some points? Hammer Smith, uh, the, the, the scoring or detailed neural examinations for the babies between three months to 24 months, it is not applicable for newborn examination, but it's a good tool if you want to do a, a baby on follow-up. But again, as I told you, whether you can do Dubo weights or you can do other examination. See, basic format or the principles are the same. Whether you do it in a structured format or do it in a traditional way, the choice is yours. But Hammersmith is for babies who are between three to 24 months. Thank you, thank you, sir. If the baby is looping throughout the examination, what do you do? Good. Go to sleep and tell the examiner that so the baby could not, I could not wake up the baby. So my, I could not do a detailed neurological examination. So again, as I told you, uh, in the exams, you are faced with such a situation. We do not expect you to forcefully do, but maybe meantime, take the history, wait for some time and gently see if the baby wakes up and do whatever minimal information. See, you have all... Uh, we'll give you all the allowance for saying, sir, the baby was in this position. I could not do X, Y, Z. But as long as I know what I intend to do and whatever minimal information, with that information, sir, I felt the baby's tone was normal or thing. So doing moros or doing palmar grass, pandavar, doing a little bit of passive angles, it's okay. You can gently wake up. Just wait for the baby to wake up a bit. If it's on deep sleep, uh, uh, most of your angles will be abnormally hypotonic or they will all be wider. So I think the only option you've got is to wait for the baby to wake up. Meantime, spend your time doing all other history taking and then come back to reassess this baby. Importance of Hammersmith, as I told you, is for three to 24 months, not for neonatal examination. Good method if you can do it. Uh, much more simplified visual pictures are there, easy to tick, but again, the same principles, behavioral response, tone, and a few aspects of your the reflexes are again you are going to assess but the basic principles are whether you are talking about amyl tysons you are talking hammersmith you are talking all of you are using the same principles but you are putting it in a structured format as all paces whether you do structured or whether you do this the choice is yours but as long as you can do some meaningful interpret even with this if you can tell me at the end of this examination baby is normal hyper hyper that is all i am expecting you in the exams 